When I say the word worship, what do you think about? What comes to mind and what do you believe worship ought to be and what should it do? Hey, this is Ron Danley again at Meadow Lane Baptist Church. And last time I spoke to you about the six basic functions of church. I mentioned to you that there, as God has called us out to follow Jesus Christ and to have his new life in us as we've received Jesus as God come in the flesh, showed us God and God intended humanity, died in our place to pay for our sin on the cross and rose from the dead to give us victory if we will repent of sin and receive him by faith, his cleansing of sin, and receive him as Savior and Lord to bring us into God's family, that he's given us new life and a new identity and a new purpose, but that is a community kind of thing. There's a togetherness. So church and being God's followers in Jesus Christ is about fulfilling purpose in relationship with the support of one another. And one of those basic functions that I mentioned is worship. Well, it may be that in this time of online church and, and closed down church and concerns about viruses and whatever else, it might bring up a good question for us that actually we need to have a good answer to at all times, whether in this COVID-19 time or any other time. And that is for church worship, personal worship, small group worship, whatever kind of, of way that you're trying to fulfill that, that basic need God has put in us for worship and do it in the right way, that we want to do it in a way that is God-honoring and that God empowers it and blesses it. So God's honored and we're blessed. And so what I want to do today is open up the scriptures with you for just a little bit and look at some ways we can, can have the guidance of scripture to fine-tune our worship a bit so that it's more God-honoring and impactful. The first passage of Scripture I want to take you to is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. And King Solomon had had the temple built there in Jerusalem, and they were making sacrifices unto God and worshiping God and praying to dedicate this new temple to the worship of God. And Solomon has just prayed a prayer of dedication to the Lord. And it says, beginning in verse 1, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple... They knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, His love endures forever. The scripture mentions us who are in Christ being not, so, not a building temple, but living stones built into a dwelling for God and offering spiritual sacrifices. And over in Ephesians chapter 3, the apostle Paul kneels before God the Father and prays this. He says this beginning in verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high and long and pardon me, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Sounds familiar. Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want to make some observations from these two passages about worship. From these passages and the rest of Scripture, it becomes clear that the God of the universe, Creator God, who became flesh and blood, and Jesus Christ stepped into humanity and did that work we have mentioned earlier, desires a relationship with us. And that basic need for worship that all people have is to be directed toward God and God alone and that God wants that relationship with us and connection with us and to be among us. Now that takes certain things. That takes cleansing. That takes the work of Jesus. And that's for another time for us to be able to have that relationship with God. But one of the things we find is that God wants to be among his people. 
Another thing we find is that real worship is about reverence and humility before God. A weightiness that we afford to God and we recognize. Speaking of that, we find that worship is about recognizing certain things about God and ourselves, about His place and our need and our responsibility toward Him, and re recognizing our need for His His cleansing work in our lives. We recognize from these passages that it's about love and God's love for us, and, and, and Scripture also calls us to love God with all that we are. That real worship and true worship and God-honoring worship is about uh, humility and reverence and adoration and gratitude and the glory of God, and that God responds to real and true worship with His presence, receiving that worship, and with His glory. And I want you to think about church with that possibility, that, that it might be times where His people, whether in small numbers or large, gather together in such a way that through the Spirit of God, His glory is poured out and His presence is thick, and we have an encounter with God. I believe worship is to be a life-changing encounter where we have offered ourselves to God, where we have confessed and professed the greatness of God and His place and our need and His work, and that it's a life-changing thing. Maybe in some times of worship more drastically than others, but a life-changing thing, and that worship is central. Worship is central to living out our lives as Christians, and worship is deserved and called for by God and required by God, and He deserves it. So, not only those two passages then, I want to look at four other biblical pictures of worship. One is in the Gospel of John chapter 4, where Jesus says that, the God, that God is spirit, and He desires worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth, that the true worshipers of God must worship in spirit and in truth. And I believe that is the spirit of our spirit, not just outward actions, but spirit, our inwardness worshiping God, and also the Spirit of God, enlivened and empowered and directed by God's Holy Spirit in spirit and in truth. I believe that is the truth of genuineness and the truth of Scripture. So biblically true, spiritually empowered, genuine worship. Not outward actions alone, but genuine Spirit-led, genuine connection worship. Another picture of worship from the Scriptures is Psalm 84 where we find that worship, true worship, is about hungering for and desiring desperately after God, seeking God, pursuing God, approaching God, and pouring out wholehearted praise to Him. Another picture of worship is Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8 where Isaiah is called to his prophetic ministry. And what, what we find in there is that worship is a life-changing experience where we experience God, recognize who He is, recognize our need, confess those things, receive His cleansing work, and then hear His call to go out and live out His purpose in our lives and world. And then finally, Revelation chapter 4 where we find that worship is by God's invitation through the redemptive work and blood of Jesus Christ centered on God, where God is celebrated, His work is celebrated, where there is surrender and adoration and profession and confession of the greatness of God and the work of God. What I'd invite you to do as you think about worship, whether alone before God, in a small group of people, corporate worship at church, official church, is to think about these things we've said from Scripture, about the nature of worship and the call of worship, and begin asking some questions. Look at these characteristics and begin asking, is my worship this? Are these biblical characteristics there? And what needs to happen so that my worship can become more biblically aligned, more God-honoring, more life impacting as God moves. Worship is vital. We need worship by ourselves and we need worship with others. I pray you'll take this to heart and I pray God will use it to have a great impact in your life and bring glory and honor to Himself as your worship is sharpened and God honoring and blessed. Take care for now.